So last time we, we stopped with an argument for a uh, fractional charge uh, matching the Yarmouth bone phase for taking a quasi hole around for a walk and matching it with the berry phase. So let me just uh, let's just recall what we did in the last time. <laughs> So we had a quasi hole, and we moved it around, finding a certain area, and there was magnetic flux going through that area, and it's going to the whole plane. And we matched the Aronoff home phase of uh, 2 pi times E star over E times pi over pi zero. In the very phase that we calculated, it was equal to, there was an I, then there was a 2 pi I coming from, if you remember the argument, when we calculated the very phase, there was this uh, contour integral, and then there was the, <coughs> the density inside the, inside, um, times the area, right? And uh, this is basically the, the number of, uh, of electrons inside or the charge, uh, yeah, the number, or the charge divided by uh, E. And we said that uh, this number is just, uh, this was the density. <coughs> And the density side. And the density, we, war we argued that it was uh, the density of flux <coughs> times nu. So the density of charge is the uh, density of uh, uh, flux times the filling fraction. <coughs> and this one here is phi, phi zero. And we got, canceling all the factors, we got the P star was equal to minus nu times, uh, times e. Okay. So now I'm going to use this type of calculation to Exactly the same argument, but not with one, but now I'm going to put another. Actually, before I do that, uh, the, I should say, okay, this is the derivation of uh, uh, the third one that we have of a fractional charge. <coughs> but we should ask a very important question before we go any further. How to measure fractional charge? <coughs> This is all theorist play thing. Now you have to ask, okay, is that real? <coughs> so let me discuss a couple of experiments that there were trying to actually probe <coughs> this fractionalized charge. There were two, there are two types of uh, measurements that were performed. They're both tunneling experiments. One involved tunneling of uh, <coughs> between the edges you know, of a hull bar. And I'll explain the joint in a second. And the other one type was a tunneling into the bulk. The first one was done by two groups, one in Saclair and one in the Weizmann in uh, 97. And the second one was done more recently by Yakubi. So, 
first, um, let me discuss this one. So this idea of uh, uh, using tunneling uh, between edge states, and more, more precisely using, looking at the noise in the tunneling current, I think the original idea was uh, actually due to the sui. Uh, there was an experimentalist who comes in with a uh, good idea, and then from here, there are some uh, theoretical studies from by Kenan Fisher, myself, Frieden Wen, and by uh, Friendly Woodley and Salaire, where we looked at uh, at uh, what would the signatures be a fractional charge that one could look and uh, see in the tunneling experiment. So what is the geometry? So if you take a whole bar, <coughs> so suppose you have a whole bar on my whole bar here first. Then I have contacts, source, drain. <coughs> have your whole liquid. And suppose you put a couple more gates that you use to squeeze the electron liquid. Okay? So if you put gates on top, you squeeze the electron density and you can have a very narrow constriction here in the middle. This is this is a point point contact. And um, quasi particles that are gapped in the bulk, but when they come to the edge, they're gapless. Because of uh, um, one way to see uh, this is even in the integer <coughs> effect is that you know when your Fermi level is in between Lendo levels, to create an excitation involves taking one quasi particle from one end of level and kicking it up to the next one. But when when you come close to the edge, uh, because of the confining potential, that bends the Lando bands. And then when the Lando band meets the Fermi level, at that point, you can create excitations, just like a, you do in the case of a Fermi liquid by taking um, one state from the occupied ones into the <coughs> ones that are not occupied. So a try here would help. So if I have um, if I have my Lando levels near the edge, <coughs> my chemical potential is here. And the bulk, well, if I want to create an excitation here, take the selection from here to there, I have to pay a large energy cost to get. But it, all these states here would be filled because they are below the Fermi level. And you could ask, okay, which kind of excitations, for example, neutral excitations can you have? Oh, just take this particle which is filled here, just move it a little over to where this one, this level is, have a hole and a particle, and then this can cost as little energy as you want. Just like in the Fermi liquid, you can create a particle volume excitation very close to the Fermi surface. So these excitations uh, go along the edge of the sample. And you can tunnel, for example, you could imagine why well, if you have a quasi-particle, if this quasi-particle tunnels, uh, you're going to have a deviation from the whole current. Uh, due to this current that tunnels, because this current I should be equal to the, the whole current, mu e square over h times the voltage, minus the tunneling current. So the tunneling current reduces, messes up your quantization, okay? So your relation between, so you see, without the tunneling current, this equation is actually the whole conductivity, but uh, if you have some tunneling current, that will mess it up. Of course, you never worry about it in the large sample because uh, you know, if the distance between the edges is very far, you're never going to tunnel between them. So you need the gate. 
Okay. Now, just measuring the Stanley current tells you nothing about the charge of the carriers. Uh, let me draw an analogy here. So, a current, if you measure current, you know the average flow of charge. For example, say you have a dripping faucet at home. Then, um, okay, it's annoying, it's dripping there, and uh, you want to figure out how much water is flowing there for you in time. Okay, so you leave a, a bucket under the, the sink, right, under the, the faucet, and leave to work, come back, and you see how much water is in there. <laughs> you measure how much water, you know how long you were away, so you can figure out um, you know, the total amount of water divided by the, the total time that gives you the rate at which water is flowing, right? So you know the rate. Now, do you know how many droplets <coughs> fell, or the size of the droplets? Do you know that? Can you tell that from just this measurement? No, right? Because all you know is the, is the total amount of water per unit of time. You know the rate. But you don't know if they're big droplets or they're small droplets, they're falling. So similarly, <coughs> if one only measures the tunneling current, you get no information about the size of the charges they're tunneling. But if you sit there, uh, you know, and get tortured by the by the water you know, dripping on the body, and you, for example, you say you count the number of droplets. Now you know the volume of water that's going to be in the bucket at the end of the day, and you know how many droplets fell. So you could define and figure out the average size of the, the drop. Or, you know, if, if somehow the, the droplets are incorrelated, you could look at just the noise it makes. Okay? If it's not periodic, the water dripping is going to be kind of periodic, right? But uh, suppose that they are uncorrelated events that they can fall. If you listen to the noise, you can also figure out how much charge is flowing. So this is the idea that, uh, for example, if you look at the shock noise, suppose that uh, you have tunneling events, they're uncorrelated, they're very dilute, so, so suppose that the, this tunneling current can be made very, very small so that you have dilute events, this is time, and you have events that, that are, if they aren't correlated, the noise spectrum should be white. And there is a relationship between the tunneling noise, um, uh, the noise is measured by current current correlation, and the charge of the carrier. So there is a relationship between these two. So if you can measure the current current correlation or the noise and the current, then say you plot one versus the other, Expression, you should get some uh, straight line. <coughs> so when the current is sufficient, it will be large. Let me tell you something that happens when the current is very, uh, very small. So what if, for example, this current is very small? Say, say you don't bias the junction, so there is not even this current. There's still going to be fluctuations. There's gonna, still going to be noise. So here, that fails because you can get noise without no current. So near, for small currents, there's still going to be some noise. What this is, is thermal noise, it's Johnson noise. It's just a function of temperature. Okay. Um, but at high enough currents, this will bend, and then the slope here will tell you the, the charge. So, change the notation, let me call this Q in general. So these two experiments, what they did is that they did measure 
<coughs> ST versus IT. And they find, for example, when they, they uh, the system is in the integer effect, the slope here is for E. And they get their data points. Right? This is funny, right? The curious way of putting the error bars. But um, you can look you can look at these papers. Uh, one is a, a, a paper by uh, Resnikov's uh, group at uh, Weizmann. It's a nature in the wrong, it's 1997. And the other one, it's basically exactly the same measurement is a PRL by Latinx group, uh, also 97. But then they measure for the uh, one-third effect. And they look at the, then, there it is, something with a slope e over 3. <coughs> So that's one experiment that wrote. So it's real. It's not as it's not just a theorist uh, uh, plaything. What is ST again? Sorry. What is ST? The ST. ST is the uh, noise uh, spectrum, which is defined just by the current. Current. If you calculate um, um, actually, this is ST. Uh, let me write that ST of omega. That's just the current current correlation. This is the symmetrization here um, for the current current uh, at frequency of omega. So integrate for all times. And this one here is actually the limit when omega goes to zero. Okay, so it's a low frequency. Actually, in the experiments, they didn't take the omega goes to zero because you have a, one over f noise, you have a lot of stuff here. All you need is to take a, a frequency. Look at a, a frequency that's high enough that you don't, you're not uh, plagued by one over f noise, but it's still the characteristic frequency, the other characteristic frequency in the problem uh, is omega, let me call omega j, yeah, like a Josephson frequency, E V over H bar. And but this this frequency scale is going to be very, very high. Yes? <coughs> what we talked about before, you were you had like a magnetic flux for a pole, other super connected actually makes like a cross pole or something. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now we're talking about these edge states that are excitations just Way to park the hole. Mm -hmm. And so the tunneling here, you, you are you talking about the charge of one or the other or both um, when, when we're talking about this? But when you're talking about this, these excitations. See, in the other case, <coughs> we created the, the excitation by hand, we put the, the flux in just to think about it. But these excitations are going to be there in the system. Okay? Um, uh, not in the book because of the gap, but in the edge you can create them. Okay? So, um, so you're saying it's the same type of excitation? It's the same type, but let me use a, uh, as an example. Suppose that I had <coughs> this. Take that, uh, this geometry with the hole and put the, put the flux through the hole using, remember when we, we calculate the charge that gets pushed out as a function of the flux? So if you insert one flux, one. In reality, what you do is like you push charge e over three from here to there. It's a long state one third. So that's exactly one excitation that you have charge minus one third here and one third there. But this is this was not done to tunnel. You just you, you made an artificial arrangement to push the charge out. But these but these uh, but on the edge there uh, you have an excitation that you can excite like you can excite for example. Just like this was a neutral excitation, but for the, uh, say, a glucose form, a non-interactive picture, you can have quasi-particle, quasi-holes near the edge. But then you can take your quasi-particle and tunnel to the other side if this distance is small. But there's a one, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the excitation on the edge and the bulk. Like, for example, if I had put my flux here, 
I would have created charge one third, uh, minus one third in the middle, but the plus one third has to go somewhere, and it will actually get, get pushed out to the edge. So they will create an excitation on the edge. I will actually have more to say about that when we talk about statistics. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Now, I won't talk too much in uh, detail, but there's another experiment which is coming into the boat more recently by uh, Jacobi's group, where they tunnel vertically uh, into a two-dimensional electron gas. Now, because of there's disordinance to a dimensional electron gas, sometimes you form puddles, uh, you form dots. And then you can calculate the, uh, can look at the spectrum for adding particles into this, uh, these regions. And they do the experiment, they look at the levels uh, for uh, nu equals one, nu equals two, and they see uh, there's certain you know, levels. And when they look at, say, nu equals one third, they see that uh, there's like a, a, the, the spacing between the levels go down by a factor of one third. Okay. Which means that uh, you know, you, you're actually you're able to add a fraction of the charge. Um, now, uh, actually, well, in these probes, I think that they look at the addition by looking capacity. I mean, because you could ask, okay, you cannot add charge one third to a quantum dot, but that if the quantum dot is isolated. But if it's a dot here that's immersed, uh, there's a dot here, a dot there, you can add one third if the whole thing is embedded in the hull liquid. See, this is a very important thing. These charges, they only live in the hull liquid. If you pinch it, you cannot tunnel, uh, you, you cannot move quasi particles around. For example, in this geometry, you can tunnel quasi particles. If you pinch the point contact too much, if you apply too high a gain voltage here, you separate you're dropping into two pieces. And now, only electrons can jump here. You cannot have a quasi-particle tunnel. Quasi-particles don't live in vacuum, okay? Or another way to say, they live in a special <coughs> vacuum, the, the quantum Hall fluid. They don't live in the empty space. So then only electrons can tunnel. And one can actually, for example, in this geometry, when you pinch off, if you were to do it, that limit, even even when these are fractional hull, say, you would see a slope of one relaying this tunneling current and its noise. Okay. Uh, but then, when you do tunneling to bulk, uh, I assume some, some STM tip is coming about. Mm -hmm. From the STM tip, only... Only the can come in. in. Yeah, but actually, <coughs> I think that... Uh, now, I forgot the details in that measurement. I, I think that they just look capacitively. But, uh, and then they change uh, gate voltage to add the electrons there. So the electron that's going into the, the, the puddle, it's not coming from the, let's say, from the tip. It's coming from the reservoir, the other regions uh, in the liquid. Yeah, that's uh, the other thing. Like, uh, if, you, if you tunnel an electron, Supposing you, sh you insert an electron into the hull of it, but that electron is going to break into three quasi particles. But at the same time, if you actually want to take a quasi particle out of that system, you actually have to, you can't, you have to take three of them, recombine into an electron so you can pull it out. There are things that, for example, I, I looked at this problem some time ago of uh, under average reflection in the quantum hall effect. Okay, this is something that's also interesting. Because remember what Laura talked about uh, uh, normal under average reflection. You shoot an electron, the electron cannot go into the superconductor, okay, it costs a lot of energy. So instead you get two electrons in the superconductor as a Cooper pair, and you bounce back uh, a hole. You can also have a similar effect in the hull bar, in the point contact, that if you have a point contact between a hull liquid in a, in a, say, Fermi liquid. Now, the Fermi liquid, which is the normal state where that, that's working like the superconductor in the following sense. If you shoot a quasi particle that has charge uh, one-third, that cannot go into the Fermi liquid. 
So you shoot an electron instead in the Fermi liquid, and you have to bounce back two quasi holes which charge minus two thirds. Okay, it's very similar. Okay, now let, let me um, keep moving and talk about uh, fractional statistics now. Claudia? Mm -hmm. Sorry, maybe it's a relevant question, but if I look at this setup, so this is drain and source, uh -huh. yeah? So, if I if I switch off the voltage of the drain and source, I can at least easily yeah, realize it through the quantum pump in, in this kind of setup. And I'm curious, uh, then the quantized charge... You mean a pumping, a pumping in the sense of... Then I would need two of you need two. constrictions. But then, so the transmitted charge would be quantized, and how is it related to this... Yeah, actually, we looked at this problem of pumping in a, in a Luttinger liquid, okay, because these are actually realized higher Luttinger liquids, but even, even in the problem of, uh, uh, you could take a quantum wire and do the same thing with interactions and uh, uh, realize a uh, Luttinger liquid. If you pump, what we found out is that you can only pump uh, integer charge. Um, and what happens is that, uh, the best way to, to look at the pumping is that uh, if you do adiabatic pumping, see, at low energies, uh, see, when I apply a voltage, I can actually sustain this current, but the, in the lead, uh, when the voltages go down, the tunnel is actually a relevant perturbation, and uh, it would actually pitch off the problem at low, at low source rate voltages. So in that limit, so in the adiabatic limit, you can only transmit electrons. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, you can actually talk later on. We looked at this problem in, uh, of, of pumping in a uh, uh, quantum wire. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let, let's, let's start talking about fractional statistics. Integer spins are fermions, and uh, integer spin uh, particles are bosons, right? So that's the, the spin statistics. <coughs> Here, right? So you have uh, There's another possibility, which is uh, no we object sanions. And what's different in uh, 2D and 3D is that um, if you have two particles uh, in 2G, that's first in 2D. If you wind one particle around the other. Okay, let's wind it up one more time. You take the path that you went around. You cannot, you cannot uh, deform this path down to one point. Okay, that's because suppose okay, uh, what's happening here is that uh, think about this as a you know really a pole, right? And then. You walk around, and you're winding, you're lacing this pole. So you cannot, uh, you know, you, if you pass around with your, carrying your rope, you tied up the pole, you know, you're tied, you're chained to the pole, right? You're like, just like you chain a bicycle, right? A pole. You, you cannot do anything unless you knock off the pole, and you can take the, and then you can uh, uh, perform the contour to, to zero. That's not the case in 3D. 
3D if you have two particles, if you wind them around. Whatever path you took, you can deform it slowly into a point. So that's the difference between uh, 3D and 2D. So what's interesting is that this possibility here, which is a theoretical possibility, is actually realized in the in the Von Hall effect. Let me now make the argument that as you take one quasi hole around the other, you pick up a statistical phase, just like when you take two fermions and you wind them one around the other. If you exchange them, you get a phase of pi, right? Versus a boson, then if you exchange two bosons, you get a phase of two pi. So if I have two fermions, if I exchange them, I get pi. If I actually wind it around completely, I get two pi. Now, if I take two quasi holes and I wind them one around the other, I'm going to pick up another phase, which is not going to be two pi. So let's calculate what the space is. And actually, I'm not going to do uh, uh, much to calculate. I'm just going to use whatever we already use to calculate the, the um, fraction charge. Because remember that when we calculate the, the very phase of adiabatically moving this guy around the other. So let me actually write the wave function for adding two quasi holes, one in position ZA and another ZB. This is I just had my two quasi holes, one in ZA and the other one ZB. That times the psi three. In general, is it for free infection? No. Question. Just a second. Let me just write this if I can. Yes, sir. Um, does the A and the B have some mutual factor between them, or do they sit at the same site? Oh, no, no, no. Z A and Z B? Yeah. No, these are two different complex numbers. So they, 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 so they can't be at the same position. Um, they can. Well, then I would interpret them as two quasi holes sitting on top of each other. Because suppose that in that experiment that you insert one flux quantum, you insert two. So inserting two multiplies, <laughs> the first time you insert, you shift the all wave functions from you know, Zm goes to Zm plus one. If you do it twice, Zm goes to Zm plus two. So notice, for example, I make them both zero. So you multiply them by Zi squared. So it's exactly shifting okay. all of the wave functions by two. So that, that's putting two on top of each other. <laughs> Of course, we're neglecting any uh, interaction. For example, if you have Coulomb interaction, that will cost energy, right, to bring the two together. But uh, I'm neglecting that. Okay, let's let's recall. So, how we did the other uh, uh, computation? Well, we we made the ZB a function of uh, time, and we took that guy for a ride. So we wind it around. So let me just, that's what I'm gonna wind on once. And if you remember the very phase that we computed, what was it equal to? There was an i, then there was a, a two pi i, because of the um, integration of the quantum tour. Then there was the, the the integral over, over uh, a certain area of the density, but this area um, was the area circled by the path. That calculation doesn't change. Okay. Now you could ask uh, about two situations. One is if you take a path that doesn't encircle the quasi-particle. But in that case, this density inside is exactly the one that we already used, right? So, ZA is inside the path, 
sorry, is outside. Here we get in this density times the area, we just get the nu times phi over phi zero. Remember, flux is times the nu gives you the um, total electric charge. And that's it. That's just as before. This thing plays on low. But now, if ZA is inside the path, now when we do that integral of the density, uh, you know, the density uh, times the d2 r as I go around, or well, the density inside change because now that I have I have this quasi hole and that changes the, the total charge inside, the total number of particles. So the total number of particles now could be what you had before minus uh, and when you see particles here maybe electrons minus I'm missing uh, a third of an electron. Right? Because uh, having this guy here means that you have charge minus uh, one third of E. So I'm missing, I'm missing that much charge. So since this is number density, I'm missing a nu. So we pick up the, the same aronoff bone phase, but there's this correction here. So you have a correction due to the presence of the other part, which is minus two pi times uh, minus nu, which is equal to two pi nu. So you pick up, on top of the aronoff bone phase, you pick up an extra phase by winding around the other quasi part. So there, this here is the statistical phase. And we usually draw this statistical phase we call it as a ratio of, uh, so theta over pi, um, actually let me, let me rewrite the statistical phase here. As uh, two theta. Let me explain why. See, when when you say fermions, if you exchange them, you pick up a minus sign. Well, exchanging them means like we we, we wind it only half the way. If you wind, you know, the, the around, you pick up twice that pi. So the statistical phase is. Uh, so when you wind one quasi part around the other, like we did here, we're actually picking up twice the statistical angle. So this angle is two theta. So that means that theta divided by pi is nu. So you have a fraction. Uh, that's why we call fraction statistics. So you have a one third the uh, statistical angle of a Fermi. This is a check. If you put, plug in nu equals one, you get that theta equals pi. So exchanging two quasi particles give you a pi. Okay. Yes. Uh, how should we imagine this procedure of of uh, making this exchange process? So, is it important that the center of this loop is very far from the from the path, mm. or is it important to do it just slowly? Actually, both of them. You pick up on something that I, I was uh, uh, quick here, but. Um, but I should explain better. You have to do it slowly because we, we're using the adiabatic theorem, right? Very is something that's adiabatic transport. If you actually try to, so this, uh, if you were to move a quasi particle too fast, you would start like generating a lot of excitations. Okay, so you have to do it uh, slowly so you don't generate excitations. Uh, that's part of the adiabatic uh, 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 theorem, right? You have to do things slowly. Now for the other one, I never said how big, even in the other argument when they didn't have this quasi hole, I never said how big this uh, walk had to be. And there is an issue there. Because what's the size of this quasi particle? Here you're thinking about a point particle, right? 
but it has a size. So let me draw the size and remember that this here came from integrating the density over a certain area. But what is exactly the 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 area? What's the size of the quasiport? The quasiport has a size. So I have some uncertainty in this area here because I don't know, you know, the, the quasiport has a size of a magnetic land. So I have that uncertainty uh, in what I'm calling area here. But if I take the path, the radius of the path, to be very, very large, my area scales as pi times the radius square, and any error that I make because of, uh, I mean, this is the yellow, that this line here actually has some finite thickness. That error is negligible. For the AB phase, for example, remember that AB phase, the standard just gives us something like nu times the flux divided by phi zero. If you make a, a little error on the flux, when you, at the end of the day when you divide, um, you, get, you get a term that goes down as uh, one over magnetic lens divided by the radius square in, in the calculation of the chart. As long as you make that radius big enough, that error goes to zero. But, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I have this impression that this wave function of the quasi quantity is it's non local in any sense. So there is a way everywhere in space. Mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, the wave function in terms of the electron coordinates. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, oh. So it seems to me at least that oh. it's not a way from to localize somewhere in space. Oh, okay. Yeah, hang on, you have to. to separate two things. The quasi-holes, they are basically, they are parametrizing a, 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 the wave functions. The wave functions are written in terms of the electron coordinates. These are just, you know, ZA and ZB are just parameters. It's just saying that if I put two quasi-holes in the system, my system is really made out of electrons. And then you have, you know, there to be 11 electrons involved here. Uh, in, in this two dimensional electron gas uh, per centimeter square, something like this. And I'm, I'm moving, I, uh, the ZA and ZB are just two parameters, so I have a family of wave functions that are parameterized by ZA and ZB. And, uh, and as I, I wander around, I, I walk around in the space of wave functions. So, you change the ZA and ZB, you don't actually move. And a locally defined wave function. I mean, a wave pocket, you know. You don't move a wave pocket, this is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm not moving. Well, but I, I know that when I talked about this width here, yeah. um, well, when I see, it's the quasi hole and quasi part will have a well defined position. So when I did this part of the argument, I moved around and I do my contour integral, that's all fine. There's no uncertainty. The uncertainty comes. When you say, well, I we have to integrate the density inside that path. But the density itself, okay, then I, I have to worry about the, that, that width. So there is an uncertainty in the, uh, you remember, this thing came from some integral of the, of the density inside the area. Clear, you know, so mm -hmm. the wave function of a quasi-quantum as a, as a state in space mm -hmm. is not a locally defined wave function. Yeah, actually, in, in this case, I wouldn't say it's, uh, let me interpret it, I don't, don't want to say it's the wave function for a quasi-hole. The wave functions for the electrons, the quasi-holes are basically the, you know, the defects. So for example, that, that's the way I look at this. And it's no different than, for example, um, say you have a vortex in a superconductor, right? You, you know, it's the, the electrons are the things that are made out of the state. Your vortex is just you know, something that you can treat externally. You can think about that as an effective uh, 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 particle, but in reality, it's the, what makes it up are the electrons. So here, it's the same thing. These are just the positions, these are the effects. Right? But the, the thing that makes up the system are the original electrons. Well, 
got but the chart one third mm -hmm. is associated with these words. Yeah. They are the excitation. Is that correct? Yeah, they are the excitation. So it, it's <laughs> like it's like the notion of quasi particles, right? That uh, okay, these are the excitations we describe them in terms of those entities. But uh, if you go back to the real microscopics, the microscopics, the, this is a, you know it's the way functions should be written in terms of the original electrons. And, sorry, I, I see Claire raising your hands. Is it one hour over? No, 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 no. it's a question. Actually, yeah, almost one hour. Okay. Uh, no, I have a question. So, if you if you actually write an effective uh, wave function for this quasi ball, uh -huh. uh, what's the reason integration of, uh, of the modulus square of this wave function to uh, get a value one third for the charge? Which is probably an answer. That would be the magnetic uh, length. So the magnetic lens is the is scale here. So these these one third objects are localized within a magnetic length. Right. Uh, and for example, if I wanted to calculate uh, really the, the electron density, see, because when you wrote this row of four, it's actually expectation value from operator. But uh, this thing fluctuates. Right. But the fluctuation, you don't care about that uh, as long as you take a radius that's very large. The, the amount of uh, 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 charge that was inside your circle doesn't fluctuate. This is actually, there's a, 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 it's a very delicate point if you think, okay, well, I'm, I'm saying that I'm turning out a, 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 an error of order one here, but since I'm going to be dividing by the areas, an error of one over the area. But this is kind of like that too, right? The important thing here is that you have to, it, it requires a very careful subtraction that you have to compare, you know, you have to compare things like the phase you pick without the hole and the phase you pick put in the hole, and whatever error you came from the uh, the width of this path, and the uncertainty from that. Well, it's the same in the two calculations. As long as this guy is in, deep inside the, the circle, and and often these you know, calculations like this, you always have to do with respect to some base. You know, base point. The base point is the difference between these two. Even if the two, even if I add error here, error there, the difference between the two, the error will cancel because it's the same. Okay. Now. Oh yeah. yeah. That, that, that's a good point. But as long as you integrate, there's always going to be an error. If you integrate over a whole space, for example, you'll get one third. Remember the argument, we, we put this a flux, and we, we argue, okay, there's charge one third that's going to go away, very far away from thing. The minus one third that's set, set here, if you, suppose you compare the charge density before you put the vortex and after you put the vortex, and uh, you plot it as a function of position. You're going to have this profile that's going to decay with a width of uh, uh, magnetic land. So even if you don't integrate over the whole system, but say you already take a, a circle of radius 10 LB, you know, almost all the charge is there. Actually, l let me go into a digression here, but I think it's an important digression that if I get to talk to about um, other systems where you have fractionalization, these issues of uh, what is uh, this fraction charge, is it just an average, or, come, uh, or, or is it something like a concrete, is it an excitation? Many of these questions were originally addressed already in the case of uh, polyacetylene, which was the first case where uh, uh, there was a, um, uh, where, where a fraction charge was uh, uh, proposed. Never observed experimentally, you know, without a, a shadow of a doubt, I would say. Uh, anyway, those are very dirty systems. Um, but um, there, the question was the following. You can calculate the average charge, fine. You find in polycyclic was one half. But in which sense is it like a real fraction charge? It just means that, okay, the density is one half. But, uh, for example, think about a problem where you have two wells and your electron is either here or there, or it's in a superposition. You know, if, you, if it's half the time here, half the time there, I have charge one half there. That, that's not it, okay? Because if you calculate the second moment, the delta Q squared, the dispersion, right? The variance of the charge, uh, 
Kevin in, the, in, in that state, you'd find something that's non zero. In, the ca in that case, what you do is that uh, you take the region, calculate the charge with a Gaussian profile that a probing function around your fractional charge. Construct that operator, the, in the integral of the, your charge operator times that uh, function. That operator, you can show that uh, uh, in the linear when the radius of the, uh, the probing function is much larger than the radius of your uh, uh, fractional charge excitation, that uh, the variance of that operator is actually goes to zero, meaning that uh, that excitation that you can construct, like this one, the plastic hole, is actually a nice state of a charge. <coughs> um, let me see. Let me talk about probably fractional statistics again. So, we proposed also uh, a long time ago, this was uh, 10 years ago. Around 97. Yes. That if you put two point contacts in a hall bar, contacts, not one, <coughs> then you could hope that um, if you could construct an excitation, you can put a quasi hole there. And let me draw something here. For that measure, we propose that uh, there should be a top gate. To help, actually the top gate was uh, fundamental in this proposal because we need to control the density somehow in the middle. If you could put a quasi hole, now imagine that there is one that comes in here and tunnels along this path. Okay, another quasi hole or quasi part that comes here and tunnels along this path. But instead, it could also have <coughs> gone over and tunneled along this path. So you have two paths. One of them encircles the quasi hole, the other one doesn't. So that means that there's interference between these two paths because uh, there's an extra phase that's picked up by going to the, uh, around the quasi hole. There's also the, the AP phase of going around. So you, there are two phases that you have to go around. So my you could stop there. Okay, that's it. You use that uh, uh, setup to manage it. But it turns out to be actually very delicate because um, <coughs> For example, one thing that uh, people who do iron level bone measurements in, uh, uh, um, in, in rings, mesoscopic rings, that uh, there you can take for granted that uh, you put your flux, all you have to worry about is what the flux is through the ring. <coughs> but suppose here that you change magnetic field. You'd say, well, if you change the magnetic field, yeah, that, that's your iron level bone phase that you're going to pick up. Uh, because you're encircling that close path. But to give an idea of uh, kind of complications that would come in experimentally is that in the whole liquid, so suppose you fix uh, uh, your number of particles. Uh, remember we talked about this in, in the circular gauge, you have, you have these orbitals and you fill these orbitals. Let's even talk about the liquid one that's simple. You fill all those orbitals. Increase your magnetic field because you're trying to put flux to your system. Two things could happen. If no quasi hole is formed in the, uh, in, in the bulk, your orbits, as you increase the field, magnetic length gets smaller and smaller, right? So your whole thing shrinks. So when you think that you put one flux quantum and you had the, you know, a certain area, no, no, you, you should, your area is not preserved because the whole thing shrinks. 
So it's very hard to think about an interference management where you, the shape of your ring is not fixed. Okay. Now, in putting one more flux quantum, that shrinks the orbits, uh, you know, shrink by one. If I put in the flux quantum, suppose that instead your outer edge remains where it was, which is good news because then you have your, your interferometer, the, uh, the size of your path is fixed. But you put that quasi hole. Uh, that quasi hole comes in with extra flux. Okay? So indeed, you insert it, the, the outer ring remains the same size. But it also comes in with a statistical phase. And these two cancel. Um, in such a way that uh, if you were to plot like uh, any fluctuations in the in the currents as a function of flux, you would just see the usual periodicity of uh, one flux quantum that you see in mesoscopic. Okay? So one has to do a much more careful uh, job by trying to preserve the size while controlling the charge. So that's why the stop gate would be important because what you would want to do is they put one flux one through the system, but then control the gate voltage in such a way that you bring another charge from the charge, say, one third from these things that you can think about reservoirs. That's why it's important to keep these oh, uh, channels open. And that charge would fill in this hole, and that way you would observe um, well, and when you see that you completely cancel the phase, it's actually a, 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 you can you can then go on and interpret uh, that as a measurement of fraction charge. And because uh, we know that otherwise that statistical phase was compensating or not bone phase, you can argue indirectly that we have fraction statistics. So this was a uh, this was our proposal. Recently, there has been some uh, uh, measurements by. Uh, uh, Goldman's group, uh, where he claims that uh, he actually observed uh, fraction statistics. There's still some issues that uh, are not so clear about the electrostatics of the edge uh, to actually argue that uh, unambiguously those measurements are, are probing, but that's you know a step in the right direction. Okay? I think one, one needs uh, uh, to look further into this problem. But, but now, let me actually uh, turn how am I doing in time, Claudio? You have 25 minutes. 25 minutes, good. 25 minutes, I can do this. That um, this geometry was actually uh, uh, proposing many recent experiments to probe non abelian uh, statistics. And it turned out, which is actually a nice surprise, that even though <coughs> systems that have non abelian statistics, which I'm going to talk about soon, are, you know, in a way much more complicated than these. It turns out that uh, this experimental signature would be much simpler. It's, uh, it's a non and off effect, okay? Either if you have a quasi-particle in that island, you see something, if you don't, you, you, or actually if you have an even or odd number of quasi-particles in that island, you see something uh, or not. So those are good experiments when you have a non and off. But, so let me, let me switch gears now and talk about systems um, where you have quasi particles that have non abelian statistics. So let me first say, okay, why is it uh, to be non abelian? Uh, sorry, just quickly. Uh, they told me that they're actually behind schedule, so you can make it a little shorter. Okay. Around 20 minutes. 20 minutes, <laughs> okay. But let me see how far I, 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 I'll go. Okay. So let me try to make the discussion more qualitatively so that we can actually squeeze all of that in those 20 minutes. Let's see, here we're only talking about phases. As you wind things around, you pick up, uh, you pick up phases. Um, so it's just the phase is a number, it's a complex number. But suppose instead that uh, you have your particles, and uh, the fact that you have a certain number of particles gives you uh, here a certain uh, uh, restricted, uh, you know, some some Hilbert space. That as you wind these particles around, you actually do operations in this Hilbert space. You pick uh, non abelian phases, for example. Uh, if you have two states, say a two-level system, imagine that uh, 
winding them is like taking a state, uh, like a the state works just like a say a spinner, and you multiply by uh, uh, two by two matrices. And you you instead of just changing the state by a phase, you change the state by multiplication by a, a matrix. That that's the idea. But let me let me get um, let me try to, to make this more precise, and um, and also say that uh, one of the interesting uh, uh, consequences is that. Uh, the fact that uh, as w you wind these particles around, you do operations in some Hilbert space, you could actually use this to do quantum computation. There is also a connection between these states I'm going to talk about and the uh, P wave superconductors. So, so some of the candidates for such states is the new equals five halves, and I'm going to write five halves as two plus a half. The two means that uh, um, see if my my density is high enough, I'm actually going to completely fill two Landau levels and have a, a half field Landau level above those two. And I'm going to only be concerned about this uh, half field uh, level. And I'm going to write a wave function. I'm going to call it like And I'm, I'm going to consider the case where I have a two n electrons. Um, well, if the system is large enough, it doesn't really matter if you have an even or odd, just like the superconductor. And well, we don't have to write a wave function for a one third state. We just have to put the, the inverse of that third here in the here in the numerator. So I'm going to put a two here. And if you insist on putting back our our Gaussian pieces of the wave function, put that back. Okay, this is a wave function for nu equals a half state. The problem with this is, can somebody tell me a problem with that wave function? No, it's not anti-symmetric, exactly. It's a, actually, it would be a good wave function for bosons. So we have to anti-symmetrize. Now, let me anti-symmetrize by writing something. I'm going to explain what it is. The function of one of these guys in J. The function in short, the function of a matrix in short, is the square root of the determinant of that matrix. If the matrix is an anti-symmetric matrix. And you can, if you want, uh, you can define, let me just write it formally. What it is, just like the term is you use permutations to define, then I take the matrix, the permutation. something, if you square it, you get the determinant of the matrix, okay? Now, what it is, and uh, let's take the simplest case. Well, the simplest case, if I just have two parties, and then the determinant of, uh, this is a, an example. If I have a two by two matrix, it's like this. And if it's anti-symmetric, I'm going to put a minus here, is equal to one, two, zero. Then the function of this guy is just 1 over Z1 minus Z2. What it does 
uh, there's two things. One, it fixes uh, our uh, symmetrization problem. Now, now this wave function is anti-symmetric. But also what it's doing is it's taking this kind of nu equals half state, well, which had the wrong statistic, but it's fixing the statistics and putting some pairing. Pairing why? Because so now your wave function, you, you like to be sitting, Z1 and Z2, like to be sitting together. So you're attracting particles. Pairwise. See, because I permute them, but here I have this uh, pairwise term. This pairwise term, it doesn't change the feeling fraction. One thing that you should check is, see, when you expand this product, I have uh, uh, order n square terms. This guy is just order uh, n. So it's not going to be the large n limit that doesn't affect the feeling fraction. It just fixes statistics but put correlation. The other thing that you shouldn't be worrying about, your wave function is not blowing up when z1 and z2 get together because there's a term here that's z1 minus z2 squared. So that's fine. Okay. So this is what we call the pair on a hall state. Um, and uh, this wave function is proposed by uh, uh, Reed and uh, Moore some time ago, close to 20 years ago, I believe, now. 15. The function is on two integers of level three. The other way can be different. So, for example, it's a three half state. Mm -hmm. why, is it why isn't it a three half? Or why isn't it the one half? The answer is energetics. See, the one half state, because one half, is actually something that looks more like a, a very, uh, if you're careful here, you could just say it's like a, a Fermi liquid of something we call composite Fermi. So it's very different. It's really a question when when you talk about these states, you have to. Uh, it becomes a question of energetics. Why is the state not another state? So that this state happens in the in the five halves and not one half. It's, it's just because that uh, when you go to the third level, right, that uh, the, uh, the wave function, the, 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 the stuff that uh, you know, we've been uh, uh, not too careful about, it, it changed slightly. So it's a question of energetics. That uh, once you put that <coughs> extra structure, that extra level of detail, this state ends up with a lower energy than uh, than uh, some other state, like for example, uh, quote unquote, uh, uh, from a liquid type state of one half. <coughs> so it's a question of energetics. Okay. It's the same question that you can all, you, you can write the Laughing wave function for feeling fraction, say, twenty one. But that's, that's not going to happen because by then you're going to have a Wigman crystal. It's a question. That's also the same reason why, uh, you know, in stripes, in the, in the, in the you, you don't see these stripes at the uh, feeling fractions, uh, uh, you know, low feeling fraction. There you see the, the, the lofty states, but you can see stripes in the nine halves, <coughs> for example. Then it becomes a question of energetics. Now let me, Since we're running out of time, let me let me just uh, talk a bit about quasi particles that you can add these wave functions, these pair wave functions. Um, let me add just two for now. Okay. Um, if I add two quasi particles, I can um, just write. Um, Let me call this Psi 2, so we don't have to rewrite it. You get Psi 2, and the far thing here is of uh, Z1 minus Zeta 1 times Z2 minus Zeta 2 plus 1 exchange Z2. Uh, that's just the outside of the J. All right, let's the J. <coughs> I 
Sim. So you can write quasi quasi whole, or quasi particles. This is a whole. You should say it's a whole. And you know you can play the game, but uh, but let me say, say some of the interesting things that come out of that game. <coughs> if you put in more than just two, if you put two in. can show that uh, if, if, and if these holes are very far away compared to the magnetic length, then five minutes, okay. Then there is a degenerate Hilbert space from the, the, the space as you as you move around, you're not changing the energy the, of the system. Really, it's a fixed energy. The, the energy will depend on the on the number of quasi holes. Uh, it's an excited state, the ground state is this guy, but it's an excited state that's fully controlled by, by you know, putting something that pins the hole at a certain place. You're forced to have two n quasi holes. Then that Hilbert space, has a dimension two. N minus one, so it grows with the number of quasi holes. Um, and as you wind these quasi holes around each other, so suppose, for example, let me take uh, this guy and exchange with this guy. And let me number them one, two, three, four, five, six. And let me draw on the world lines of these guys. So one. As a function of time, I didn't move one, so one is constant. I try like this. Same thing for two. Same thing for three. And then four and five, they got winded. So if I if I look from the side and they're moving, I did like this. It looks like a braid. I exchanged them. This was four, five. And six was left alone. So I braided them. And if you keep on braiding, for each braid, uh, there corresponds a unitary operation. In the Hilbert space. So you can you can compute, you can, you can take a state, and you can start applying unitary operations by moving these uh, quasi holes around. Now, let me just, in the last few minutes, talk about some way to think about this, uh, where this degeneracy comes from, perhaps in a simpler uh, uh, setting. I don't have much time to do to, to details here, but uh, the physics here is very similar to P wave superconductors. Okay? And, uh, <coughs> so, P wave superconductor is one where the gap depends on K so for P. Minus or plus, depends on your chirality. Either one is a, is a P wave. Uh, P plus IP or P minus IP. And if you, and if you, uh, this for example, P wave superconductor, uh, you know that by the angular momentum, uh, if you're in the, in the P channel, uh, it has to be a uh, spin uh, triplet superconductor. Or a spinless superconductor too, if you have a Fermions without spin, that would do it. Uh, because the wave functions are in the symmetry already due to the, to the your, your P wave. Um, now, 
If you take a, a superconductor that has an R parameter like this, you put a vortex, then you can solve the bogey above the gen equations and find out that there is a bound state near your vortex, localized around the vortex, on your head vortex, um, and that in this state, you can write um, something which you call a Majorana Fermi. Yes, okay. one minute, I'll, I'll wrap it up. So there's this bound state. Just like our quasi particles, quasi holes, there, there's some bound state there because of this vortex. Now, if you have two such vortices, and that's okay, well, what, what does it mean that, uh, that uh, Majorana says? So let me say you have two, two vortices, one here, one there. I can put together, let me draw the string connecting them, I'm going to put together an operator psi, which is n1 plus i in theta 2. And psi is a complex Fermi. It's the, our good old uh, Fermi that we, we, you know, like the ones that Shankar used in, uh, in his lectures. So those guys, we know what to do with them. We know that there are two states, to the occupation zero or occupation one. So you can think about this, well, it's our qubit. It can be zero or one, depending on the occupation of that state. But the interesting thing is that that state, if these two vortices are far away, that state is kept non-local in, in space, right? It's, it's a state that uh, uh, it, it lives on the string between these two faraway vortices, okay? It, it's not something that's local, like a, a spin in a quantum dot that you hit it with a hammer and then the thing flips. This guy is inside a superconductor and it lives non-local, it's shared between these two states. So um, it is very stable. Okay? And it's stable against uh, the phases. So that's why uh, these kinds of systems have been uh, uh, studied uh, with an eye in uh, topological quantum computing. Because you just realize that your two level system that is uh, uh, very robust against uh, the environment shaking you up and down. So let me just, uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up by saying that, uh, so recently in the past couple of years, there have been a lot of work in, on this and how to detect and using extended versions of this uh, interferometer. Um, and many other ideas, including if uh, Law's poster is still, where's Law? Okay. If uh, his poster is still outside, you guys can take a look. He's been working on this uh, problem of uh, uh, probing uh, Mm -hmm. statistics. So, <coughs> so I, I hope that uh, that uh, we mentioned give a broad overview of the fractional quantum Hall effect, and uh, um, I would say that uh, even though it's, it's a problem that's been around for a long time, there has been a lot of interesting ideas, and um, that are actually spinning out. That, uh, you shouldn't think that they're confined to quantum Hall, you know, system of electrons and magnetic field, for example. Many of these ideas. Uh, you also apply to P-wave superconductors, and so on. So, all right. Four minutes over the one hour and fifteen. Okay. That's not too bad. Questions? That's the best time to think. Okay. There are no questions? Oh, one question there. Yeah. Hey. I, I think I, I didn't I get the, the right idea on the, when you have your dots, you have, you have your electrodes, you apply uh, a field, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow you shrink, uh, you shrink the, 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 the size of the, the, size of the, <coughs> of the bulk condensate. Mm -hmm. right. uh, but this, this, these are normal areas that you, the, the areas that remain of the material that are not, uh, that have no these, uh, this, uh, this state, this block, this... Uh, oh, when you say shrink? Yes. Okay. So, what, think what about the, the system with the 
Um, okay, any system has edge, it's right, defined by the uh, confining potential. So even in the absence of an, uh, a magnetic field, you take your electron liquid, it's going to be confined by, by some potential. Okay, so it's going to form some puddle when the Fermi level crosses the, you know, the potential. So here, it, it's the, uh, what defines the system, uh, the size, is actually the electrostatics. But, uh, but for example, one, one thing we could have uh, 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 solved in, in the lambda problem, you can also put, say, a parabolic confined potential. And you can see that the, the, the idea that if you put more flux and shrink the orbits, that still remains. So the problem was that if you keep your uh, number of particles fixed, and if you, let's take an example that you increase the magnetic field by a whole lot. You're really shrinking the orbits. So you're taking that uh, uh, system and making it uh, more and more confined within a smaller radius. So you're changing the size of the puddle. So if you want to keep the, the outer edge where it was, you have to either bring more charge or... Yeah, that's <coughs> There will be no break between the two talks, the next, this talk and the next talk, so someone has to go to the bathroom, I can take more, one more question, you can do it now, otherwise we go on. So if anyone has other questions, come forward.